We're on part five of this sermon series where the spirit moves in, the pastor moves over, the people move up, the church moves out, and we move forward together. We're talking about the nature of our church and what characterizes us and makes us who we are. And I chose the parable of the Good Samaritan because for Christians, it's kind of a master story about what it means to follow Jesus. For the Old Testament people, the Exodus was the master story of God bringing the people out of bondage in, Israel, uh, in Egypt through the Red Sea into the Promised Land eventually. It's a master story. For Christians, the Good Samaritan is a master story. The parable of the sower is a master story. The, the, the prodigal son who runs away and spends all his money on wine, women, song, and who comes back, those are kind of master stories. And the story of the Good Samaritan, of the, of the man who was beaten by the side of the road and the religious folks walk on by, the Samaritan goes and helps him, is a master story. And at the end of it, Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. That's what we're called to do, to go and do likewise with the message of God's grace and forgiveness. So part of what defines a church that moves out is a church that does likewise. A church that moves out goes and does likewise. What defines a church is not its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. A church that seats a thousand people but doesn't send any of them out is not the kind of church that goes in the direction that Jesus wants it to go. This church, Zion Lutheran Church, needs to be and is a place where the church moves out. And you know that it moves out into a world that desperately needs to hear the gospel of grace, love, and forgiveness that we believe, teach, preach, act on in everything we do here. And there's all kinds of people in your neighborhoods or schools or places of work that are just like the man by the side of the road and that are beat up by circumstances oftentimes beyond his or her control. There's a world of hurt out there every day that, that you and I pass by and whether we know it or not, there's I really do think more people struggling with life than we're willing to admit. Some people might be having financial struggles, relational struggles, struggles with abuse or neglect. Others, I think, are struggling with a sense of meaninglessness, kind of wandering through life, wondering, is there more to life than just having a job and a career and paying bills and loving our families and being a decent citizen? Is that all there is to life? Isn't there something more than that? Isn't there a deeper meaning or purpose in life? I think in, in one of the things that's been talked about a lot lately is the people who are spiritual but not religious. They're looking for meaning and purpose and direction in their life and oftentimes they're not finding that in church. They're not finding that in the place that should give them the most meaning and purpose in life. There's people struggling all the time with a broad variety of issues and they're there by the side of the road. We oftentimes don't even know the pain they're in or the depths of their struggle and so oftentimes we just pass by going by on the side of the road. Now. Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go to those by the side of the road and extend a helping hand. That's what the Good Samaritan did. That's what we should do. Pretty pure and simple. Kind of. Kind of pretty pure and simple. Having said that, it's, it's not that pure and simple. Let me share with you three brief stories. First, a while back, there was a test given at Harvard Divinity School, which is a seminary where students are trained to be pastors. To be at Harvard Divinity School, you have to be pretty smart, and these smart theological students took a course entitled Christians and Society. And the professor made, created the final test, gave them three hours to finish it, and they were to write during those three hours an essay on being a moral Christian in an immoral society. Being a moral Christian in an immoral society. Halfway through the test, he arranged for a break. 
where the students could get out of the classroom for a 10 minute break and they were to leave the room for <clears throat> some fresh air and then come back for the last hour of furious writing. The first part of the test that students were writing and writing as quickly as they could, writing all that they knew about how to be a, 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 a Christian uh, with morality in an immoral society, and at break time they went out to the courtyard where there were tea and cookies. However, out in the courtyard, the professor had also arranged for a man to be there, all beaten up, in tattered clothes, looking in need of help. The students drank their tea and ate their cookies and thought to themselves, well, what do we do? Because we have a test to take. We have to get back inside. And so all of the students went back into the classroom where the professor announced that they had just all flunked the test of being a moral Christian in an immoral society. A second story, again, from a divinity school, a place where seminaries train people to be pastors, researchers gathered together a group of seminary students in a classroom on one side of campus and told them that they had an assignment that day which was to preach an extemporaneous sermon on the message of the Good Samaritan. However, the place that they were going to give this off-the-cuff extemporaneous sermon, was the place where it was going to be recorded, was on the other side of campus. And the students needed to get there as soon as possible because of the tight video scheduling. And since this was something that was set up by a group of researchers, they put several actors, if you want to call it, to be people, look like people in distress, swamped in various places, coughing. Some of them poured a bottle of scotch on themselves so they smell, looking hurt and suffering. And so these students, in their haste to record their extemporaneous sermon on the parable of the Good Samaritan, hurried over to the recording studio and just about every single one of them avoided the suffering people. In fact, one even stepped over the body of the suffering man as he hurried to preach on the values of the Good Samaritan. Now, before we're too harsh on seminary students, let me tell you a third story. When I moved to Portland 14 years ago, I came across something that I didn't see in Minnesota. That is, people at the exit ramps with their tales of woe on cardboard, and I was moved. We didn't have that in Minnesota. We do now, they do now. Um, but for the first week I was here, I gave out a $5 bill every time I, I saw them. Every time I entered a freeway or came off one, kind of like paying a, a, a toll, you know, to get on and off the freeway. After a couple days, I went to the bank and got $100 worth of $5 bills and kept handing them out. Second week, I got another $100 worth of $5 bills. I mean, for goodness sakes, I not only did I know this parable about the Good Samaritan because I had just preached about it back in Minnesota, but also all of these folks were, were Christian. All of them have God bless on the bottom of the signs. I mean, heck, maybe some <laughs> of them were even Lutheran. <laughs> Eventually, my bank account ran out of $5 bills, and I felt like I was letting the world down because isn't that the point? Isn't that the point of the Good Samaritan? Well, maybe, but it's not the simple point of the parable. Maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe, like what I did there, I realized in Beaverton, I was a part of a church that had the largest food pantry in Washington County. Here, I belong to a church that is involved in Jericho Road, Jericho Table, many different places that, that really help people who are in need and many different ministries here. Maybe it's not the simple point of the parable because when the parable tells us that this lawyer went to Jesus, we think lawyer, attorney, law school, but really that word lawyer is only used twice in, in, the, in the Gospels and it wasn't a lawyer like we know it today, rather it was someone who knew the Old Testament law contained in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, which they considered to be the law of Moses. This lawyer who was versed in the law came to Jesus and note, he came to put him to the test. He came to put him to the test. 
He really doesn't want to know what to come to believe in Jesus. He's not interested in eternal life because he's an expert in the law of Moses. He's an educated man who came not to learn anything from Jesus, but to test him. And he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? What one thing can I do to assure my salvation? How many boxes do I need to click in order to be saved? He, take, he asked Jesus this question to test him not to learn from him. So Jesus responds and he says, you know the law, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the law says. But that wasn't enough for this lawyer, the, the person who knew the law, who already knew that. So notice in our text too, it says, then the lawyer said, seeking to justify himself. Again, he didn't want to learn. He wanted to test and seeking to justify himself. He says, so who's my neighbor? So Jesus tells this parable of the Good Samaritan who came upon the same scene as the priest and the Levite, the lawyer and the seminary students and your pastor, and maybe even you have, who have walked around or avoided. To this lawyer, to this questioner of Jesus, to this one who was brought up to hate Samaritans and never help them at all because he thought that's what the law said, you help the people of faith, but not the Samaritans, not the ones who are different than you. After he tells a parable, Jesus says, now, who's the one who followed what God wants him to do? Notice the lawyer doesn't say the Samaritan. He can't even bring himself to name him. He just says the one who showed mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. So how do we go and do likewise without, like I did in Portland, just one $5 bill after the other and paying a freeway toll every time I got on or got off? How do we go and do likewise without going to bed each night burdened with all the people that we step over and ignore to make it through our days? How do we go and do likewise in order to be of help but not to go to bed overwhelmed with guilt for all of the ways <clears throat> we fall short in going and doing likewise. Well, let me, let me suggest that you think about this. Realize that God has gifted you, each one of you, in a different, particular, specific way. Each one of us has spiritual gifts. Each one of us has different passions for ministry and helping others. Each one of us has different abilities, <clears throat> different personalities, different experiences that make up who we are. And the wonderful thing is that God has gifted you individually, specifically, particularly in order to reach out to those on the roads that you travel every day, the different roads that each one of us travel every day. There's no one in this world with the same friends that you have. There's no one in the world who has the same workplace as you and go to the same school you attended, live in the same house, live in the same neighborhood. There's no one in this world who has exactly the same kind of people that walk and lie around the roads that you travel. And there's no one in this world who has your particular experience or witness. God has gifted you with a witness. God has gifted you with a witness. And I believe God has gifted you with a particular way in which you can be a good Samaritan somewhere on your path through life. In your bulletin, you'll see an insert just about a, a brief two-week survey about the way, some of the ways that people at Zion are involved in some type of service outside the walls of our congregation. Some ways, just kind of a smattering of ways in which you use your gifts, abilities, skills, passions, experiences to be some type of Good Samaritan somewhere. That's just a survey from two weeks, the last couple of weeks of writing those things in the bulletin. Notice two things about that list. Notice 
in just a brief two-week survey, how many areas in which people at Zion are involved in beyond the walls of this church? Notice, second, how many people are helped each week as Zion moves beyond the walls of this congregation to the needs of those in our community and beyond? Last week, I talked about a place where the people move up, and we talked about these opportunities at Zion. I told you in last week's sermon that I really believe to be a spiritually healthy Christian, we need a ministry in church, that's what I talked about last week. I also believe, I said last week, we need a mission in the world. A ministry at, work, at, at church and a mission in the world. Those two are important for us to do to be spiritually healthy. Some people already have that. Some people already have that, a ministry at church and a mission in the world. But what if you don't? What if you don't have a mission in the world? What if you're just full up busy, you've got kids and you don't have a moment to spare for anyone anywhere, your mission is your family? What if you're not sure about your mission in the world? What if you just haven't felt that God is calling you to serve anywhere? What do you do? Well, let me suggest three things if you're wondering about where your mission in the world is to serve. Three steps that might be helpful. First, love Jesus. Love Jesus. Simply love Jesus. And then find ways that you can love him more. Love the Lord your God. Love Jesus with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. What's the first commandment? Love God, love Jesus. Second, pray for discernment. Pray for discernment that your heart would be open, not, not only for what you want to do, but where God might lead you. Pray for discernment. And then pray some more that God might use your specific individual skills, abilities, personality, experience for that kind of service. And then third, trust. Trust that God will lead and direct you to be that kind of Good Samaritan service that you and maybe only you can give to the world around you. Love Jesus, pray for discernment, and trust over time that God will lead you into the place just where God wants you to be. Frederick Buechner has written some words that I love. He says, purpose, or meaning in life, or direction. He says, purpose is where your deep gladness and giftedness meets the world's needs. Purpose is where your deep gladness and giftedness meets the world's needs. So love Jesus, pray for discernment, and trust that God will lead you. Then you can serve more, love more, <clears throat> trust more because the church of Jesus Christ is a church where the spirit moves in, the pastor moves over, the people move up, the church moves out, and we move forward together. And so we continue on our way. In Jesus' name, amen.